Good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We're ready to start another in the glory of God. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Mark, chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. We are commanded, given a great responsibility, through the Great Commission, to go into all the world, to take the gospel message to everyone. Jesus left the welfare of the church in our hands. That can be frightening, can't it? Jesus left the welfare of spreading the gospel in the hands of people. We are responsible for maintaining the church and making church that, making sure that the church is alive and well and thrives, not just survives, but thrives. And it's our responsibility. <coughs> now, many people struggle with the, the going into all the world part for different reasons. They have all kinds of reasons. However, Jesus, Jesus told us we need to do it. Now, going into all the world doesn't necessarily mean I need to go halfway around the world. The world starts outside our door. We can go to our next door neighbor. We can go to their neighbors. We can go anywhere in the world in our community. But we just need to go out and take the message of love and of grace to the world. We need to make every effort to be obedient to Jesus. Amen. Not everyone's going to listen. And that's okay, because God created us to be able to make decisions on our own. So when we go out and we present the gospel, some people are going to be receptive. Some are not. All we're told to do is to take the message. So we need to give them a message they can understand. But that being said, the first thing is that we need to always be ready. We need to always be ready to share the gospel. We never know when we're going to have the opportunity. We don't know when God's going to open a door and coax us through to share the gospel. Because chances to share Jesus are all around us. I mean, think about the amount of people you might see in a typical day. Think about how many people you talk to in a typical day and how many of them need to hear the gospel. Probably more than you realize. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, always being prepared to make an offense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So when somebody says to you, why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in Jesus? The last thing you want to do is go, duh. <laughs> you want to be able to say, because he died on the cross to take away my sins. He's made me worthy of eternal life in heaven with God. And only through that blood can we get that. That is why I believe. Because I've seen him work in my life. I've seen the things that, that his love can do. I've seen his power in other people's lives. That's why I believe. And I know God is God of truth. And when we live lives that reflect God's love, believe me, somebody's going to ask you about it. Somebody's going to want to know what it is that sets you apart. Why do you act different from all my other friends? Why don't you get involved in some of these activities that we're involved in? How can you always be so happy? Because I have God. So as we live out our sermons, we will also get the chance to speak them. We also get the chance to take that message. We've got to be ready. We've got to be prepared. So we have to know in our hearts why we believe 
so that we can tell other people why we believe. And our reasons may not be the reasons they need. But when they realize we have our reasons, they'll find their own. And of course, preparing is the easy part. Getting ready. When we love like God loves, our desire is for souls to be saved like God. In 1 Timothy, and I don't have that going there, but 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, it says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So when I love like God, when I think like God, and God's desire is that all men be saved, then that's going to be my desire. It's going to be my desire. That God has put in me this love for all mankind. Yep, and that even means the evil people. Because God loves them all. God sent Jesus for everyone. we have a desire that all men be saved. That all men be saved. But notice that first part of 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord as holy. When Jesus is the most important part of our lives, people see the way we live. And then you'll be easy to talk about. When people see that our life revolves around Jesus. We don't stick him in where he fits. He is the reason we live. When he sits on the throne of our hearts, our desire will be to share him with everyone. And of course, love is the key. We've got to love. And here's where that next verse really comes in. God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Why? Because God loves the world. John 3, 16. God loves the world. And so he desires that all people come to a knowledge of the truth. And the only way people come to a knowledge of the truth is if it's brought to them. He has given us the message to take and told his children, take this message to the world. Very few people, none that I know, have really stumbled upon the truth without looking for it. The truth is presented by God's children. And people that may come in and not had a Bible study, or people that come in searching, they come to God because somewhere they have seen someone or heard someone talk about what God's able to do. They've heard a sermon. They've heard someone speak. They saw someone live the life that glorifies God, and they know my life is a mess. I need to get to God. Where do I go? And they realize you find God amongst God's people. And that's an opportunity for us too. We embrace them and we help them and we teach them and bring them to that knowledge of the truth. You know, the only way we lead people to Jesus to salvation is introducing them to the one who gave salvation to the one who shed his blood on the cross. And then they will see Jesus in our lives, especially if we treat them and speak to them like Jesus. Look at the last part of 1 Peter 3.15. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Sometimes that's hard, isn't it? Because you, you love people so much, you want them to have what you have. You want that them to embrace the grace that God has given. You want them to have salvation, but they don't want to listen. And sometimes that's just frustrating. And sometimes when it gets frustrating, we lose our gentleness. And sometimes 
when they give us excuses that we know aren't valid. Sometimes that's hard to respect. But notice there's no qualifiers here. Peter says, do it with gentleness and respect. That means always at all times with everybody. Because if we lose that sense of love, if we lose that sense of gentleness, we could lose that soul forever. We could drive them away. And that's not what we're called to do. We're called to draw people. Draw people. Secondly, keep it simple. Keep it simple. It's very important to keep it simple. You may be familiar with the acronym KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. I like that because simple is who I am. I want to keep it as simple as possible. I don't like complicated. One thing I hate is when you go to put something together that you bought and the instructions make no sense. And I hate when it's all pictures. Because you can't always tell what the pictures are of. I want simple instructions. <coughs> attach part A, attach B, or to part B, using screw C. That's pretty simple, right? That's what I want. There's really nothing complicated about the gospel. People make it complicated. Some people often hinder their own evangelistic efforts by making it difficult. I was reading an article by a fellow preacher one day, and he was talking about a trip he was taking, and he was on this plane, and he had sat down behind this young man. And... As the plane filled up, he kind of watched this young man leaping through his Bible. He said, that's pretty interesting. Well, then when the airplane was getting ready to take off, the young man asked his seatmates if they knew Jesus. And he thought, this is great. He's got a captive audience. He's going to take time to, to share the gospel. But he said, then the problem hit. He said he covered everything from creation to Armageddon. And that just confused people. That just confused them. I mean, you think back to the day of Pentecost when, when Peter was preaching. Yeah, he gave a history of the Jewish nation, which those people listening, they knew all that already. He was just recapping. But then when he told them this, this Jesus that you crucified, God has made both Lord and Savior. And they cried out, brothers, what do we do? What do we do? The answer was simple. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. He didn't have to cover creation. He didn't have to cover what was going to happen at the end. Here's what you've got to do now. Here's what it's all about. This is where you start your walk. And see, when we present the gospel, we can't get tied up with fancy words. We can't be concerned that we're not smart enough, that we're not intelligent enough, because it's not our power that converts people. It's the power of God. It's the power of God that brings people to him. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul said, it's not my power. It's not the wonderful words that I use. It's not how good looking I am. It's the power of God through his word. That's the power of salvation. It's the Holy Spirit working on people's hearts. Touching them, prodding them, convincing them that these words that they're hearing are true. And it's what they need. It's what they need. There may be those that listen to the gospel and walk away. 
But there's not one person that can say, I don't need the gospel. Well, they can say it, but they can't mean it. Because we all need salvation of sins. We all need forgiveness. Evangelism is not about impressing people with our smarts. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, and verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now we need to understand that Paul was a very highly educated man. He sat at the feet of one of the greatest teachers that the Jews knew at that time, Gamaliel. And he was very highly educated. But yet he tells the church at Corinth, that's not how I'm trying to bring you to the gospel. That's not how I'm trying to introduce Jesus to you. I know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Because that's what it's all about. I've known several preachers that went on and got great educations, and then pretty soon the congregation asked him to leave, and they said, he talks over our head. He talks about things we have no clue about. Let's go back to keeping it simple. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the basic gospel message in a nutshell. Jesus died for our sins so we don't have to. And that's what we need to tell people. Are there things in their life they may need to change? Yes. But spiritual growth and spiritual maturity is a journey. It's a journey we all take day after day. Every day we try to grow, grow closer to Jesus and become more like him. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. It's something we do. And as we evangelize and we bring people to Christ, and we have these babes in Christ, it's up to us to nurture them and to help them, to love them. And you know, sometimes that means allowing them to make mistakes, and allowing them to fall, so that we can be there to help them up. It means embracing them and hugging them and encouraging them and saying, it's okay, God still loves you. God's still with you. God doesn't ignore us. God doesn't turn his back on us just because we sin. And God's people should never do that either. Should we? Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we have to remember where we came from. We have to remember what our spiritual walk was like when we first became a Christian. It's not easy. It's not easy. Because when you're a new Christian, Satan's coming after you with both barrels blazing. He don't like to lose. So he challenges you. And we as a church, we need to be there for those new Christians to encourage them and let them know even if we fall, we're still here. Just like when Jesus was talking to Peter and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan is out to sift you like wheat. He says, but when you return, when you return, strengthen the brothers. So Jesus said, Peter, Satan is out to tempt you and you are going to you're not going to stay down. You can still get back up and encourage the brothers as they encourage you. That's, that's exciting. It's exciting. Something else, as we're evangelizing, oh, wrong one. don't use church language. Now you may say, what do you mean by that? What I mean, we in the church, we have a language that many outside don't understand. They don't know what it means. Terms like plan of salvation, you may think, well, that's something simple. But there are people that may have been to churches and denominations or wherever for years and never heard that. 
They don't know what plan of salvation is. And so that can be confusing to people. Some people, I mean, not understand faith. Well, they may know what it is from a basic standpoint, but don't understand from a biblical standpoint what faith really is. And it can be confusing. Now, I'm not saying you can't ever say the word faith because without faith it's impossible to please God. What I'm saying is the language we use has to be language we can reach people with. Language they understand. You ever talk to anyone that didn't speak your language? Tammy and I spent time in Russia. And we don't usually have an interpreter with us when he's out in public, but this one day, the interpreter left us. She had to pick her daughter up at school. She said, do you think you all can get to your apartment on your own? Sure, we wasn't that far away. We're walking down the road. Now, mind you, I'm wearing a big leather jacket with white sleeves and a big orange T on the back. This is Tennessee Volunteers. But we're walking along the sidewalk, and this guy pulls up beside us, and he starts asking, I guess, directions. I don't know, I don't speak Russian. And he's just going on and on, and Tammy and I are looking at one another. We just keep doing this, and he just keeps talking. Pretty soon I looked at him and said, no, Ruski. And I don't know what he said, but I don't think it was pleasant as he sped off. I mean, he, we had a language barrier because I didn't speak his language. He didn't speak mine. And sometimes when we're presenting the gospel to people, we have that language barrier. Even though we both may be speaking the same language, it's the words. They may mean different things to them. So we want to keep it simple. We want to keep it simple. We've got to know our audience. We've got to know how to reach them. And Paul said the easiest way to do that is to get yourself into their place. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 22, I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. We've got to put ourselves in their position. We've got to reach them where they're at. I don't know where we're at. That's like taking your six-year-old and saying, when you go to kindergarten, you need to know as much as a teacher. No. You reach them with simple language, terms they can understand. And we do the same thing. Finally, don't force it. Don't force it. As much as we gauge our success on baptism, that isn't what God considers success. That's not what God considers success for us. Paul said it best in 1 Corinthians 1 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. God considers us a success if we're planting in water. If we're just doing what he's called us to do. Because frankly, no matter how good you are, no matter how much knowledge you have, no matter how simple you keep it, some people just aren't going to be interested. Some people are just going to walk away. And that's fine. That's their choice. That's their choice. Most people need more than one session before they become a Christian. It's really hard to sit down with many people just one time and explain the gospel to them. I mean, it's, it's done. Some people have that ability. But most people need more than one time. And most people aren't converted from coming here on Sunday morning. One on one. Getting together outside of 
this intimidating atmosphere. I mean, we might think that was intimidating. But for someone who's walking newly into Christ, coming into a group of people that are spiritually mature, or should be, it can be intimidating. They don't want to ask questions. And sometimes they walk away with more questions than they come in with. So when they're not in a situation like this, they can feel comfortable asking questions. They can feel comfortable trying to understand. And then people will make the choice. God created us to be able to choose, to hear the facts and make a choice. Not everybody makes the right choice. Has anybody here ever made a wrong choice? Sure we have. We all do. Because we have the ability to choose. But remember what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. So here the, the message of the gospel has been presented. Now someone has to make a choice because there's always a choice to be made once the message is presented. Do you believe? Yeah. So you're baptized and you're saved. Do you believe? No. So you walk away. The choice is up to the individual. Yes, it's discouraging to watch someone walk away because we know they need it. You see, all we're called to do is to deliver the truth of the gospel in a loving manner. To bring someone the opportunity to hear the truth. And the individual chooses their destiny. We cannot drag anybody into heaven kicking and screaming. If they don't want to go, we can't drag them in. They have to walk in on their own. They have to make the choice. Sometimes we will plant the seed. And sometimes we will walk it. See, we all have a responsibility in evangelism. You may not be the one out there hitting the streets and, and preaching to people, but you may be the one reinforcing the lesson they heard. You may be the one encouraging them. You know, you're planting the seed and that person walks away and left them because you never know who they're going to run into later. You might water that seed. Some of those seeds may lay dormant for years before something happens that causes that seed to grow. But we have to be encouraging. We have to be uplifting. Because evangelism is a process. And it often takes more than one person to bring somebody to Christ. Somebody's teaching, somebody else is encouraging, it's just watering and planting. Some people are planters, some are waters, some are harvesters. Some are harvesters. Oftentimes, we are each of these, but not all of these. But not all of us ever know each other is. We may be the planter, the water, and the harvester. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're just the plant. We may not even know who waters or harvests. But we planted the seed, and that's what's important. That's all God calls us to do. Plant the seed and water it. The rest is up to him. He'll call us to harvest. Remember what Jesus told his apostles in John chapter 4, verse 37. For here is the saying that holds true. One sows and another reaps. Friends, it doesn't matter when a person comes to Christ who they tell, I want to be baptized. It doesn't matter who they tell. Just praise God that they came to their decision. Just praise God that the seed has been planted and has been watered and now it's starting to take root. And like I said, we may not even know who they tell. Friends, 
evangelism is something that we're all called to do. We all have a part in it. Planting, watering, and harvesting. And God has given us the message to take to the world. But we have to remember that the power to save is in you. The power to save is in that message, not in us. It's not in our talents. It's not in what we do. But one thing we can do is always be ready when the opportunity arises to tell people about our faith, about our hopes, to be able to explain it simply. Einstein once said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. And that's something good to live by. Explain it to a six-year-old and understand it. You might say, well, some people might get offended by that. Well, maybe they will, but the gospel is simple. It's a simple message. And then we explain it with love. One of the most rewarding parts of Christianity on earth is bringing others to Christ. And it causes rejoicing, both in heaven and on earth. We praise God. So let us strive to carry out our commission so that we can feel that. We can feel that excitement all the time and never lose it. But again, just like someone who's presented with the gospel, the choice is ours, to do it or not to do it. And God's not going to force us. He just calls us to do it. So we have to make the decision. If you're here today and you've never been baptized for mission of sins, maybe the seed's been planted. Maybe it's been watered. Maybe you're ready. Maybe you're ready to be baptized, to be saved, to become a brand new creation. You have that opportunity to do that this morning. Christian, maybe you are lacking the desire to go out into all the world, to do your part in evangelism. Go to God and ask for the courage that you need. Ask Him for the motivation you need. Ask Him for the wisdom. He'll give it to you. He'll give it to you because He wants to see you succeed. Maybe you need prayers in the church for a physical ailment or spiritual ailment or something that you just need the church to pray for in a public manner. We'd be glad to do that for you. Just respond to God in some way today, publicly or privately, as we stand and as we sing. Oh,